polls show that many people believe in creation, but their specific beliefs differ quite a bit. Will the real creationist please stand up today on Creation Magazine Live? Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Today we're talking about uh, the different beliefs among people who call themselves creationists. Will the real creationists please stand up? <laughs> well, there's certainly a number of people on the planet today that consider themselves creationists. Yes. Yep. Um, they believe in some sort of creator or intelligent designer, etc. But the, the details of how God created, uh, um, you know, when he did it, that, that type of thing, that, that starts to get a little fuzzy when you look at the specifics of what each person believes. Right. Even among Christians, there's a variety of different views on creation, a range of beliefs. There are young earth creationists, that's, that would be us, biblical creationists, gap theorists, progressive creationists, God created progressively, evolutionary creationists or, or theistic evolutionists, the framework hypothesis folks who go with that particular view, retroactive death, that's an interesting one, and the day-age theory. Right. Right? Now, all of them believe that their understanding, their interpretation of Genesis backs their particular view. Right. Now, since truth is exclusive, they can't all be right. <laughs> That's right. Now, when you look at that, that list, Christians might wonder, well, how do you know, right? There's a lot of yeah. people, godly Christians, that believe in, in, in different things, and how do you, you know, figure out which one's right? Now, it's hard to even begin to categorize you know, the common elements amongst them. Oh, you, you can try. You know, some believe Genesis is real history. Some don't. So let, let's put those into different categories you'll see on the screen. Okay. There. Okay. Well, let's try a different criteria. How about the people that are Christians that believe in evolution, but versus those that don't, in, don't. In, those, yeah. in those categories? Yep. Okay. Well, let's, let's go to the ones that believe that Adam was a real person, for example, and then some, some of them that don't. And you can see the list here. Right. But watch what happens to our list if we use one very specific criteria, and that's the age of the Earth. What about belief in millions of years of Earth history? Now look what happens to our list. Hmm. There's hmm. only one on the other side. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, that, that certainly makes for a sharp distinction, doesn't it? It sure does. Um, what is it about that one topic that makes such a difference? Young Earth creationists, or, or well, we would call ourselves biblical creationists, yep. seem to be out in left field here. Now, now, why is that? <laughs> right, we're different from everybody else. Well, hopefully as we go on here, everybody's going to figure that out. But, but first of all, let's look at what we do have in common. All the Christians that call themselves, you know, that okay, believe, yeah, in, believe yep. God created in some fashion, what, what do we have in common? Well, that would be the Bible, right? Sure. I mean, if there, we wouldn't be here talking about it if it wasn't for uh, the Bible. And uh, all of these positions are basically interpretations of the text found in God's Word in the first book of Genesis, from yeah. Ch Genesis chapters 1 to 11. So the, the purpose of reading the Bible is to understand what God has said to his people right. through the prophets, the apostles, etc. And the Bible clearly states that it, uh, it's literally God-breathed, that no revelation uh, was given to the writers that didn't come from God himself. Yes. So it's, it's, it's yep. God's communication to us. And the purpose of reading it is so that we can understand what God has done, what he's doing, and what he will do. Right? So right. You've, you've, it records yeah. history, it's got rules and guidelines for living, and it's got prophecy of what will happen in the future. It's pretty all-encompassing. Yeah. Now, Genesis falls into the category of historical. Wait, what it's, happened? It's a historical yeah. narrative. And uh, what it says is not insignificant because it actually reveals the reason, the, the, the most important event in history, uh, the, the reason for that event. And certainly the most uh, precious event for all of Christians, that's the birth, life, death, and resurrection right. of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to die for the sins of the world. That's, that's the key event in history. Jesus right. died for our sins and came back to life. But where did sin come from? So what, what's the, if we look at, well, why did Jesus have to die? What did mm -hmm. he die for? He died for sin. Okay, well, where yeah. did sin come from? Uh, sin came into the world by the first man, Adam. Right. It's been passed to all men. Uh, who rebelled against God. This brought death into the world. Sin was cursed with death. And so the seed of Adam was corrupt, and so all people are therefore sinners. Um, we can read about this in Genesis, of course, but also throughout the Bible. Take Romans 5, for example. I'll, I'll look at Romans 5, 12, and then 15 to 19. 
Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through the one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin, for the judgment following the one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive an abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in, the life, in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For, as by one man's disobedience were many made sinners, so by one man's obedience will many be made righteous. Right, okay, so Genesis is very important in understanding how and why we need to be saved. Yes. There, there's yep. really nothing more important than that, and we're gonna continue when we get back. Don't you find it strange that when people go blind, we regard it as tragic? But when cave-dwelling fish go blind, it's hailed as evolution in action. There are cave-dwelling fish with a mutational defect that causes them to have scar tissue where they would normally have eyes. Usually, this is an obvious disadvantage, but in a totally dark cave, eyes are not necessary. In fact, it's actually a benefit not to have eyes because they are delicate and easily injured by sharp rocks. So blind cave-dwelling fish are better suited to that environment. But is this really a legitimate example of evolution? Evolution is meant to explain how new DNA information arose to turn non-sighted creatures into sighted creatures. But in the case of blind cavefish, we have actually witnessed devolution because the information for eyes has been corrupted and lost. Once again, evolution goes in the wrong direction. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. on Creation Magazine Live. Will the real creationists please stand up? We're looking at the differences between all, all those people who call themselves creationists. Right, okay, so, so we got many opinions about uh, creation yes. from Christians. Genesis 1 to 11 is very important in understanding why and how we need to be saved. So the question is, what does Genesis say? That's the right. thing. So we'll start with uh, some folks that differ from, from our view and see what they say. Well, we've got a pretty <laughs> decent cross-section of, of different views here. Right. Uh, first up is theologian Charles Hodge. Here's what he said. It is, of course, admitted that, taking this account by itself, it would be most natural to understand the word day, he's talking about the word day in Genesis here, in its ordinary sense. But if that sense brings the Mosaic account into conflicts with facts and another sense avoids such conflicts, then it is obligatory on us to adopt that other. Right. Wow. Well, how about progressive uh, creationist, different type of theology here, uh, Paddle Pun. He says, it's apparent that the most straightforward understanding of the Genesis record, without regard to all of the hermeneutical considerations suggested by science, is that God created heaven and earth in six solar days, that man was created in the sixth day, and death and chaos entered the world after the fall of Adam and Eve. Uh, that all the fossils were the result of the catastrophic universal deluge, which spared only Noah's family and the animals therewith. Okay, here's, here's another one. This is uh, Oxford professor of Hebrew, James Barr. Now, he's not a believer at all. Right. Uh, he said this, As far as I know, there's no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writer, or writers, he says, of Genesis 1-11 to intended to convey to their readers the idea that, A, creation took place in a series of six days, which were the same as the days of 24 hours we now experience, B, the figures contained in Genesis in the Genesis genealogies provided by simple addition, a chronology from the beginning of the world up to later stages in the biblical story. C, Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide and extinguished all human and animal life except those in the ark. There's okay. another view. Yeah. yeah. Well, how about Professor of Philosophy William Dembski? Dembski, he's, he's an evangelical Christian. He believes in an old earth. He said, the young earth position, which has been my principal foil, receives its support not only from Genesis 1 to 3, but also from Genesis 4 to 11, the latter chapters presenting a chronology that appear to allow only around 6,000 years from the creation of Adam and Eve to the present. Okay, and one more, and then we'll, we'll bring all these uh, together here. This is Gleason Archer. He's a staunch defender of biblical inerrancy. And he says this, from a superficial reading, he's being sarcastic here, by the way, from a superficial reading, 
uh, the impression would uh, the pr re impression received is that the entire creative process took place in six 24-hour days. If this was the true intent of the Hebrew author, a questionable deduction, as will presently be shown, this seems to run counter to modern scientific research, which indicates that the planet Earth was created several billion years ago. Okay, huh. so, so what are we seeing here? We're seeing a pattern emerge over and over and over again. Yes. Each of these men can see something very plainly. Genesis means what it says, right? Yeah. What it plainly says, yeah. that's what the, the writers... But, you know, God created. He didn't evolve everything around 6,000 years ago. That's what it keeps saying over and over and over again, but they don't believe it. Yeah. Why don't they believe it? They don't believe God's uh, word says what it plainly says uh, for one reason, science. Yeah, right? now, now just, just let that sink in for a bit. His, his word says that God created, not evolved, everything about 6,000 years ago. But they, and, and many of them admit that in yeah, their writings, they but they don't believe that. They admit, they admit that that's what the word says, but yeah. they don't believe it, which means they don't believe what's, what God's word plainly says. Right. And this, it always comes back because science. Or what they call science. What they not call real science. science. It's an interpretation, it's a, yes. right? Yeah. Has proven the main meaning of the Bible to be incorrect. That's what they're saying. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, now, you know, what it really means is, is that they have a different authority than yes. the Word of God. I mean, you can try to coach that in different terms, and I'm not trying to insult anybody, and if you have a different opinion than us, I'm not insulting you. But that's what it comes down to. You, you can try to make it say whatever you want. Uh, as a matter of fact, no matter what position, other than the young earth position you look at, you're going to find that each of them is held because science supposedly um, has proven millions of years and or evolution, right? Yeah. All of these positions originated of, because of ideas outside the Bible, which means that they're, what they're saying is man's fallible interpretation uh, of what supposedly happened in the past is supposed to have more authority than, than the Word of God in their minds. Yeah. And again, I'm not yeah. saying that you know, in an arrogant way. I'm just saying that's, that's what it comes down to. So we're going to look at some of the consequences of, of, of applying that kind of thought uh, in the next couple of segments. Uh, Creation Ministries International focuses on the Bible's first book, Genesis, and the creation evolution issue. Many of our speakers are scientists with PhDs who, before joining CMI, were employed in various scientific fields. Creation ministry speakers go to churches, equipping and encouraging people with the message of the truth and authority of the Bible and its relevance to the real world. To locate upcoming CMI events or inquire about booking a speaker into your church, visit creation.com. Okay, will the real creationist please stand up? Now, of course, what we're talking about here is which group out of all the different creationist positions is the correct one? And yes. that, that leads to a question. What is your standard of truth? That's a good question. That's a huge question yeah. that every Christian should, should, should be able to answer. See, if, if there isn't a standard by which the different groups uh, try and determine where their stance comes from, there would be no way to come to a conclusion, right? If right. you have a different standard of truth than I do, then why would we even have a discussion? Yeah, your truth is okay for you, and my truth is okay that, for me, right. and et cetera, yeah. Now, now, of course, most Christians are going to say, well, of course, the Bible is the standard, right? I now, hope so. Yeah. Well, hope so, because if you say you're the standard of truth, guess what? you got a big problem, yeah. right? Yeah. The, the problem is, is that you're fallible. You could be wrong. You don't know yeah. everything. You're yeah. not omnipotent, yeah. um, and, and you're a sinner. You've got a sinner's mind. Your, your heart's deceitful and wicked, according to God's word. Um, and then that's why we think and do things that aren't in accord with God and his word, right? Yeah. And that's why we need, we need Jesus to help us. So by setting ourselves up uh, as an authority above God's word, we're, we're actually being deceived. We're committing a fundamental error that, that the Bible actually talks about. You know, yeah. uh, the Apostle Paul in, in 2 Corinthians 11.3 says, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray for, from a sincere and pure uh, devotion to Christ. And, and what was the way that Eve was deceived? Right. Well, uh, Satan asked her, did God really say? <laughs> right. Questioned his word. He questioned his word, doubting God's word. As soon as you doubt God's word, what you're actually doing is judging what God said by what you think is true. You're deciding if it's true or not. Right. Uh, you're putting yourself as an authority above God's Word. I mean, there's regular doubts that we have, uh, you know, we understand uh, doubting, but there's a different kind of doubt. Right. Uh, you're, you're doubting God's Word, even though they, uh, the, the same thing we see, uh, it's with the, with the fellows we quoted from before here. Right. Um, even though they see what God's Word plainly says, they reject it. Right. Because, because of 
what they, their, their authority really is science or, or interpretations about the past. Right. Now, now some, of the, some people here, maybe some of you out there right now, are going to try to shoot back and they're going to say, look, no one can know if what they believe is right because we're all interpreting the Bible with our own preconceived biases. But the fact is, we can compare what we believe to what the Word of God says and see if they match up. Right? right. You, can, you can do that. Yep. I think this. What's the Bible say? Right. So, sure. you know, thou shalt not steal. That's that's pretty clear. If you've ever taken anything <laughs> that wasn't yours, you can look in the Bible and see that. Guess what? You were wrong for doing that, even though you thought it was OK to do it at the time. If you think the earth is flat, you're wrong because the Bible <laughs> says the earth is a sphere. You know, we read in Isaiah 40, uh, 22. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And, and the Hebrew word there, uh, uh, translated as circle, refers to a sphere. Yeah, three-dimensional right? circle. Not a so, simply yeah. a, a flat round disk. So you compare w what you believe with what God's word says. And if, if they don't match, guess what? I mean, non-believers do this all the time. They don't want to believe in Jesus, that a man came back to life, that they died for their sins. And what they think doesn't match what the Bible says. Right. Right? Yeah. Now, it, here's a quote from an atheist who uh, very clearly sees how important Genesis is to the Christian faith. He doesn't believe it. Mm -hmm. This is uh, atheist Richard Bozarth. He said this, It becomes clear now that the whole justification of Jesus' life and death is predicated on the existence of Adam and the forbidden fruit he and Eve ate. Without the original sin, who needs to be redeemed? Without Adam's fall into a life of constant sin terminated by death, what purpose is there to Christianity? None. What all this means is that Christianity cannot lose the Genesis account of creation. Christianity is fighting for its very life. Wow, he really gets it. He, he, he gets it, yeah. And he, he's not a Bible believer, but he, <laughs> but he gets the importance of Genesis. Yeah. It, if it was just a matter of interpretation, then he could just interpret Genesis according to evolutionary beliefs, and he wouldn't be able to say that. Right. Yeah. What he's <laughs> getting at is that there's an in incompatibility between what he thinks yes. science is showing and what Genesis clearly says, right? Yeah. You know, here, here's another. F. Sherwood Taylor, writing Geology Changes uh, the Outlook, um, said this. Um, I myself have little doubt that in England it was geology and the theory of evolution that changed us from a Christian to a pagan nation. Well, what's he getting at here? Yeah. Right? It, it, well, he's, he's saying that the Victorians uh, uh, used to believe the Bible, so England was a Christian nation. Right. And then geology was reinterpreted, and uh, evolution became popular, and it disagreed with what the Bible plainly said, and people rejected it and became a pagan nation. Right. That's what he said. So it was a direct so, correlation of what they believed here, what they believed here, yeah. et cetera. And, and uh, you know, if, if just accepting evolution into your Christian thinking was okay, then it would have stayed a Christian nation. That's right. the point. So the yeah. fruit here of taking evolution and trying to, you know, bring it into your, your Christianity, it, it just hasn't been positive. And we'll be right back. In 2004, New Scientist magazine published an open letter to the scientific community in which 33 leading scientists blasted the Big Bang. Their strongly worded letter included statements like, The Big Bang today relies on a growing number of hypothetical entities, things that we have never observed. Without them, there would be a fatal contradiction between the observations made by astronomers and the predictions of the Big Bang theory. But the Big Bang theory can't survive without these fudge factors. An open exchange of ideas is lacking in most mainstream conferences and doubt and dissent are not tolerated. With such growing dissension from secular scientists, it's unfortunate that many Christian leaders have embraced the Big Bang, especially when there are so many contradictions between it and the Bible's account of creation in Genesis. And Genesis is the word of the Creator who witnessed creation, unlike any scientist. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So our subject today is, will the real creationist please stand up? Of course, what we've really seen here is that if you take, if your standard, if that's your starting position, is the Bible in, in yeah. context, right? Uh, and particularly if you, if you take it at face value, like we, we were talking about, young earth creationism is actually biblical creationism. Yeah. That means our position is derived just from what the Bible actually says. Yeah, it's really it, the only game in town. Yeah, it, it's the only stance of Genesis that is based on what the Bible says without regard to the influences of long-age science and evolution. And, and people should understand that no, it's not because of facts that people reject young earth creationism. It's because of interpretations of facts, right, that they, they compromise on God's word. Yeah, there, there is ways to interpret those facts according to what God's word says that, that don't 
it, you know, it's not some cognitive dysfunction yeah, or anything yeah. like that. You can go, oh, okay, yeah, I can see how that fact fits with what the Bible says. Well, we would say the other interpretations are actually misinterpretations. Exactly. They've misinterpreted them. Exactly. Um, it's, the thing is, this was noticed, this creeping in of, uh, of this idea was noticed by Bible defenders from the outset of when millions of years began to be popular. And uh, here's, a, here's a rather long quote here by James Mellor Brown, who lived in the early 1800s. And he was an Anglican minister in England. Uh, who he, he, he saw this coming. He reasonably foreshadowed the present condition and direction of much of the church today. He, he, warned, it, he, he warned of, uh, of this dangerous compromise. And uh, you can see that in this, uh, in this quote here. He says, I am prepared to show that in this sense, religion has much to fear from philosophy, that is, the natural philosophy of science. Not its facts, but its theories. Whenever those theories invalidate the historical or physical statements of Scripture, or even when they interfere with our sober and commonly received views of it, they are pernicious. They tend to unsettle men's minds as to the veracity of the sacred writings. They shake the confidence with which the simple and unlearned repose upon them. Simple minds feel unable to untwine those threads of error which they are told run throughout the book, and they cannot distinguish, distinguish that inspired portion which they ought to hold fast from those uninspired statements of science and history which they are assured they may safely let go. Thus, doubt and distrust enter their minds, and never again can they rest with the unquestioning reliance upon the Word of God which they once felt. The sacred volume is no longer to them a rock which cannot be shaken. To this, it may be added that these theories, where they are admitted to disturb the learned and acute mind still more powerfully than the illiterate. For the thinking, reasoning man naturally argues that if any statement in Scripture has been questioned, so may another and another. And if historical or physical facts can be disproved, whatever doctrines or precepts rest upon them must give way likewise. Thus, skepticism takes gradual possession of the soul. If natural facts can, cannot be admitted on mere warrant of inspiration, by what law of evidence, it may be asked, can we be compelled to believe on the same authority those which are supernatural? When science has once begun to tamper with Scripture, it is vain to say that it will restrict itself to physical statements and abstain from the consideration of miracles. Men will no more stop halfway in an argument because you wish them, then a stone will check itself at your bidding when halfway down the hill. Yeah, I, honestly, I don't think we could have said it better. I mean, you know, you, yeah. you get some of these older yeah. quotes and it, it's kind of, the English isn't as, as but if you better just, vocabulary back then. I we, think, <laughs> <laughs> but when you really think about what he's saying, it's true. Look, the, the, the average person, you know, evolution yeah. and the Bible, does it fit? No. Right? You get to a learned person, somebody who's really studying and say, and you, yeah. and you go, look at this and look at this. Obviously, they, see, they can see the multiple nuances, the multiple you know, challenges and clash of ideologies yeah. and thinking and trying to make this fit together. And so people just don't have that, that assurity of, of they, they can trust the Bible. You know, one of the best resources uh, I, I believe ever produced by the creationist community uh, is by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. Yeah. It's this book here called Refuting Compromise. You know, if you're a Christian, you're struggling in this area. Can you really trust the Bible? What about all these other theories? Can I just trust that what the Bible says is true? I would really recommend that you order this book. You can actually get it for 30% off the regular price. Just go to our, uh, our web store, uh, click on it, get through there, and uh, just before you're uh, about to check out, you, you'll be able to put in a code CMLRC, and that'll give you 30% off. And, and it's just, I think it's the, you know, I've had people that didn't believe in young earth creationism, and I just tell them, look, read this book. Yeah, yeah. It, you're not going to find a better representation of the biblical and scientific defense of the young earth creationist position than, uh, than this book. It's right there. It's very detailed. It's very detailed. Yeah. And uh, if, you, if you don't believe it after that, well, you're, you're not going to believe it. So uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll be back in, in just a second with our, uh, our feedback section. Refuting evolution is a powerful, concise summary that explains where the common evidences used to promote evolution in textbooks are wrong while at the same time showing how creation is better supported by scientific observations. It will stimulate much discussion and help students and teachers think more critically about the creation-evolution debate. 
particularly the often overlooked differences between operational and historical science and how they relate to the topic of origins. Order your copy today at creation.com. All right, welcome to Creation Magazine Live, and we're, uh, we're in the feedback section. So we're right. looking at a feedback. This one was quite interesting. Uh, we've titled it, Is Faithless Education Possible? Is okay. Secular Education Really Religion Free? Right. That's what's thought by many people. But uh, here, here's the feedback that, that came in. I find the article very interesting. Now, this fellow is responding to an article called Faith, Not Facts. I find this article very interesting, but I find the author misses the point. That was his statement there. <laughs> When your teachers are not religiously motivated, they will teach only what there is physical evidence for. Evolution, for example, has transitional fossils and carbon dating to back up claims of extending before your world was even created. You were quite right to go to a religious school if you could not tolerate learning only what there is evidence for outside the Bible. To put it in simpler terms, science assumes the Bible is not a resource and publishes only what we can figure out without using any religious text. I'm certain you're smart enough to understand all this, he says, uh, but I've just come to make my plea. Please don't try to destroy what human rights and science advocates have worked for since the Enlightenment. Keep your religion out of public schools. That's the <laughs> feedback. Right. So uh, Dr. Don Batten from our Australian office, he, re he re replies here. I'll just read some of his responses. Um, you know, the guy said, well, when your teachers aren't religiously motivated, uh, Don said, well, pardon me, but your religious bias is showing Oops. which teachers are not religiously motivated. You know, is a materialist not religiously motivated? Mm -hmm. Right? R really? See? And then uh, he referred to an article, C is atheism a religion and the myth of neutrality. Um, you know, and then the fellow said, evolution has these transitional uh, fossils and carbon dating to back up the things. And Don said, no, the transitional fossils are notoriously, notoriously absent yes. if evolution yeah. happened. And carbon dating is a huge problem for evolution and it's claimed billions of years. Uh, for example, uh, we've got radiocarbon in diamonds. Diamonds are supposedly millions of years old. Carbon shouldn't, uh, C14 shouldn't last longer than 100,000 years in anything. And yet it's, it it's always gone. there every yeah. time we, we test it. So that, that goes against it. Um, and then the fellow said, to put it in simpler terms, science assumes the Bible is not a resource and publishes only what we can figure out without using any of the religious texts. Well, that in itself is an incredible bias, isn't it? Yeah. You're going to yeah. just say the Bible, the literature that we see there just doesn't exist. And you're going to make up a, a story purposely avoiding the history in, the, in, the, in that book. Yeah. That's religiously yeah. motivated. But you've made up your own history. Exactly. They, they claim that, that the history in Scripture is made up and they make up their own history, exactly. millions of years and so on, and then interpret the facts to try to fit into that history. Right. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you can see a lot of these types of feedbacks in Creation Magazine, and if you'd like right. a free copy, just go to creation.com slash freemag, and you'll be able to get your own copy of Creation Magazine and enjoy it. See you next time. <laughs>